We stopped the last time at verse 6, so I just have to scroll back. Yes, the verse 6 was the very, very interesting verse that we ended with last time about the hypocrite, Mithyachari. And we talked about the duplicity in personality when somebody starts on a spiritual path and instead of transforming oneself from within, merely changes external things, superficial changes. And so such a person is a pretender, a hypocrite. The word used is mithyachar or mithyachari. And we went into that in fair amount of detail the last time. So I will not repeat that. We continue from there to verses 7 to 9. In chapter 3. He, however, who controlling the senses with the mind, O Arjuna, initiates the yoga of action with the senses of action, he unattached is distinguished. Do perform the assigned action. Action is greater than inaction. Even the journey of your body cannot be successful if you are inactive. This world is the cause of the bondage of karma, except for actions performed for the purpose of sacrifice. Therefore, O son of Kunti, perform actions for the sake of sacrifice and conduct yourself as free of attachment. So, a very interesting grouping of verses here. Very often, people on this path think that they should just renounce action altogether, don't need to do anything, don't need to perform any duties, and they end up in a very passive, fatalistic kind of approach. This kind of passivity or fatalism is extremely unhealthy and this is definitely not the path of Karma Yoga. This is definitely not the idea that on the spiritual path one should just do nothing. The idea is when we speak about being unattached is not that you don't perform the action. You perform the action but without the expectation of reward. In a spirit of joy, in a spirit of love. We talked about it earlier when we said, oh, how can I perform my duty if I should expect no rewards? Everybody needs some sort of motivation. And we spoke about it at a fair amount of length that the idea is similar to when you do something you enjoy, like a hobby. Some people enjoy gardening, some people enjoy cooking, some people enjoy going for long walks. But when we perform these actions, we don't do it with a sense of purpose or goal. These are not goal-oriented. We do them purely because we just enjoy the action for the sake of that particular action. If we can cultivate this skill also in other areas, that is what we would be doing. Learning to enjoy the action for the sake of it. And such a person is a yogi who is unattached. And so, very often, this is misunderstood. We call this inaction, inaction. Which means, it seems you're not really doing anything internally. You're not really attached to something. So there's a certain sense of distance. 
you enjoy the action so much, there's such a sense of joy that you would even do a certain work that you enjoy doing, you would even do it free. Because you love to do it, you're passionate about something. And most of the time we have seen that when you have to work and you get paid for it, then somehow you lose the joy of that work. You know, then it all becomes about money, about a certain reward, and the work itself is lost. So this is the idea of performing yoga in a sense of action, in the sense of being unattached. It does not mean being passive or fatalistic. Perform that action. It's important. It says here, even the journey of your body cannot be successful if you're inactive. Why do you have a body? The body has manifested or you have manifested in this particular form because you have certain desires to fulfill. That is why you are in this plane. And that's why if you're here, because you need to perform some actions, then do those actions. Why become inactive and passive? So if we have people who say, oh, I don't want to do something, I don't want to chase this. If it happens, it happens. Well, with that attitude, it will not happen. So if you organize your life, see what it is that you want to do in your life, and go about doing it. Because that is why you're here. All this action can, however, become a cause for bondage. If you expect results out of that all the time, you're not doing it for the love of it, for the joy of it, then you get trapped you get involved in it, you get trapped in it. It's like a quicksand, you know, it's like you fall into it and you get deeper and deeper and, and you're lost. So this can become a cause for bondage if the action is not done skillfully. It says here, perform it, action performed for the purpose of sacrifice. Actions performed for the sake of sacrifice, free you. What does this mean? This is not encouraging ritualism. When they talk of sacrifice, yajya, it's not about suddenly worshipping deities. The following verses often refer to sacrifice and food. So we need to clarify that whenever they speak of Sacrifice, they are referring to something far greater than rituals. In a sense, whole of life is sacrifice. We are all the time doing things for each other. No person can survive alone. We need sunshine, we need rain, we need food from nature. We cannot divorce ourselves from these. We need other human beings around us. If you were a single individual all alone, the world would basically come to an end for you very fast. So the entire world is a form of sacrifice. We will go into this a little bit further in detail as we continue the for the other chapter the other other verses any questions so far any inputs okay so i will just continue Verses 10 to 12. I have a yes. So, is there a way to know that actually 
right now we are going through life in a way that we're just taking it as a purpose because it's it's hard it seems hard now how we are you know what our attitude is to life is there any way to kind of is there any sign that happens internally that shows us that hey actually we are doing this you know treating life right like now as a sacrifice and um, i didn't get the last line so yeah so basically uh Uh, is there any internal signs that we can look for to see that we are making progress? In the sense, the progress being that we are going to a place where we think life is better than it was. Is there any internal signs that you can look for, or more importantly, are there signs that you can look for, look for where you are going against it, where your life is actually the opposite of that? In any internal signs that you can look for? Well. there are two parts there is a part of expansion and there is a part of contraction when we evolve spiritually that's the part of expansion at all other times we are contracting when you are not overcoming this egoism when everything is revolving around yourself that is a part of contraction and the part of expansion is when you're evolving developing you're looking at yourself you are seeing how to change how to integrate how to be inclusive not to be stuck on your little identities it's very difficult to look for the signs of of these when you start out on the path of expansion initially it may seem to the person himself or herself that you are actually contracting it may appear like that to yourself because you come in touch with many of your negative qualities but to a teacher or a guide who has been through this he observes it and sees this only as a little phase in a much longer larger picture the journey is quite long in the beginning people get very impatient and they condemn themselves a lot of patience is required and as i said to the teacher this is only one little phase in a very long journey but to the seeker sometimes they begin to think they are contracting so for a seeker who is not got that big picture he may think he is contracting he may start self condemning he's not seeing the big picture so you can perhaps in the earlier stage i'd say you would only know in retrospect there are no clear signs for that i'm sorry about that it's not a you know a black and white thing that i can give you a simple answer to that there is no kind of you know benchmark that you can sort of compare yourself against it's a skill that you need to learn and learn to recognize with time and that requires sharpening the buddhi so it's really a, one of the finest skills you need to learn right yes okay but when you mentioned that one thing kind of struggle which was at the start you said uh when you're contracting you all of it is revolving around yourself yes and so yeah yes and that is a sign but at least something that Yes but you can imagine as well that when you start the process of expansion also it is about yourself but in a different way the attitude behind it is different you start looking at your negative qualities and you may be self condemning as well but so in a sense it is about yourself and so you see there in lies the paradox that's why it's not very clear then 
is this about myself really in a contracting way or is this about myself in an expanding way? If you see the entire spiritual journey can be, in inverted commas, I would say, selfish. It's only at much higher levels or at much later stage in the journey that it becomes really about expansion. Right. Yeah, uh, which is why it seems like it's very important to have a teacher who's looking at you and tell you the difference between whether it's really contraction or it's just a short place in the long. Indeed. Long Indeed. Indeed, that is one of the reasons why we need to have a teacher, a guide who has done this, who knows all the, the pitfalls that await us uh, when we go into the deeper layers of the mind, study ourselves and find that the ego, these false identities, lay out many, many traps for us. That Manas is very clever when it comes to, to taking us away from our higher purpose and can be, you know, uh, coming up with a little conspiracy together with, with the ego, with Ahankara, and misguiding you, or misleading you. There are many, many traps, many pitfalls to watch out for. And that's why um, I hesitate to give black and white answers or very simplistic answers. So we we'll continue unless Gautam wanted to add something because I see yeah. that he is. Yes, uh, Radhika ji, uh, I was just trying to contemplate on uh, on what you said about uh, performing the act actions with sacrifice, and somehow I've not been able to associate mm -hmm. sacrifice. Uh, I don't know whether that's a maybe. I I to sacrifice as something slightly negative, mm -hmm. uh, something that we give up. Uh, Somehow I was thinking that, okay, what should be the right word? And I feel offering is something which I'm more comfortable with it. So, yes. But I don't know whether there's, there's a larger meaning behind the sacrifice and, and why that discomfort. So I thought I'd just uh, check with you. Yes. Very good question and a very good insight, um, Gautam. Indeed, the word sacrifice has been associated with different things which come across in our modern life as a little bit on the negative side. Sacrifice has been associated with, you know, all those poor people who, who give up something and still get a raw deal, you know. <laughs> As if sacrificing something only means uh, at the end of it, uh, tough luck for the guy who sacrificed, you know. And that comes from a point of view of people who lay too much emphasis on perhaps material things, or material objects, worldly objects, worldly desires. And so they fail to see the higher purpose and therefore one of those negative connotations. The other negative connotation is the ritualism, the ritualistic part. And so people misunderstand sacrifice as something ritualistic. I liked your suggestion of offering. Offering is definitely a nicer word. Um, and yes, it would work. It would work much better. That everything that you do, in a sense, you don't do for yourself, but it is offered to the divine, to something higher. So if you see somebody who is just enjoying painting, People have hobbies and you just enjoy painting. You're not painting because you're a professional artist and you're putting in a you know, exhibition, exhibition or, or anything of the sort. I'm just talking about a person who just enjoys to, to doodle once in a while, you know, likes to paint or draw a little bit as a pastime. Somebody does a little gardening or enjoys cooking not as a regular duty, but once in a while, you know, it's a work of art. So that's what 
It means, you know, it's that creative spirit in us where we enjoy the very act of doing it. In English, sometimes we also use a word called self-actualization. You're doing this because, not because you need to, to earn money out of it. It's not some professional task, but for the joy of it. And when you experience that joy, where does that joy go? You want to share it with people. You, you don't want to have your beautiful garden just for yourself. You like to share that with everybody. When you cook a wonderful meal, are you going to eat it yourself? Ah, oh, that's boring. Isn't it much nicer when you share that meal with others? So all these acts, these creative kind of acts, these, we enjoy them much more when we share with others. And that is what is an offering. We offer it to everybody. We don't keep it for ourselves. And so, this idea of sacrifice is a very, very beautiful idea and should not be turned into a negative idea where you have this poor person who actually got a raw deal, you know. The verses 10 to 12 actually go further into this topic. They, they elaborate further on this topic. So I will just continue reading and we can discuss this idea of sacrifice after we have read the verse. Verse 10. In the beginning, the progenitor, having created the beings, together with sacrifice, exhorted them, multiply by this sacrifice. May this be the bearer of the fulfillment of desires for you. Cultivate the gods by this, and may those gods nurture you. Nurturing each other, you both will attain the highest beatitude. Beatitude. <laughs> the gods cultivated by sacrifice will provide for you the desired pleasures. He who enjoys these pleasures, given by them, without offering them, in return is merely a thief. If you read this from a certain point a perspective, from a certain point of view, it may very well appear that we are speaking about a ritual to please some deities. But here, see it from another point of view, all actions done skillfully is a sacrifice. All actions that are selfless, done for others, or done without the egoism in you, is a form of sacrifice. Your entire life can become a sacrifice. This is the highest form of Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga is not going to an ashram and, uh, you know, one day cooking a meal there or, or picking up some leaves in the ashram garden. That's not Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga, the highest level, is really to be a part of life with this beautiful bhava all the time of burning burning away this ego with little actions where you are doing selflessly. It doesn't mean you become this annoying do-gooder who is giving unsolicited advice to people. That's not what is meant here. It means whatever action you do, whether it's your work at home, in the family, or as a profession, you do it with that spirit of selflessness. You have, you're not coming from a place of ego, but a place of just wanting to do something well, to the best of your ability.
in a creative spirit. When you perform sacrifice in this way, perform all actions of life in this way, you will find that your desires which have brought you to this plane are fulfilled. If you perform those desires purely in a selfish manner, they will keep coming back to you. You will be fueling those desires. In one of our earlier sessions, we had spoken about the fact that desire fulfillment can go wrong if we end up fueling the desires. If we do not fulfill the desires in a skillful manner, then that is what will happen. We will fuel those desires further. They get even stronger. They multiply. But if you perform it with the right bhava, in the spirit of selflessness, in a creative spirit, out of joy, out of love, then these desires will be fulfilled. All desires that you have will be fulfilled. If you contemplate upon this verse 10, that is the secret of how to live life. The gods that we are talking about here are not deities somewhere in heaven or somewhere. These are your own internal qualities. If you nurture your own positive qualities, you will attain the highest beatitude here. Once again, this is not the best of translations. Sometimes Pandit Arya got, wrote in a very flowery manner. And the word, the Sanskrit word used is Shriyas. Shreyas and prayers, these are two aspects that all spiritual seekers should understand very clearly. Shreyas is that which is good. Prayers is that which is pleasurable. That which is good for us may not necessarily be pleasurable. For example, medicine can be bitter. It's good for us when you're sick, but it's not providing us with any sort of pleasure. That which is pleasurable is not necessarily good for us. For example, a lot of sweets, chocolates, alcohol, all these things that we derive some sort of pleasure out of. It's not necessarily good for us, especially when we start abusing these things. When we understand the difference between the two and we nurture these good qualities, you attain that highest good in you. You begin to strengthen the good qualities. You learn to perform your action in a skillful manner. And when this happens, the gods will also provide you with the desired pleasures. You will begin to enjoy everything in life. It doesn't mean that you're going to suddenly start enjoying alcohol and sweets and chocolates. You enjoyed those anyway, but those were lower pleasures. Now you begin to enjoy higher, the higher good. You're, you're not running after pleasures anymore material pleasures, sensual pleasures. You enjoy all of life and everything around you becomes like a feast. All the objects of the world are like food and you are feasting on them with the senses. So you just enjoy all of that. In the next verses, I mentioned that the word sacrifice and food will come repeatedly. And we should understand now what sacrifice means. We should also understand what food means. 
and we are referring to food here, it does not mean food as in, you know, drinks and, and eat, eating uh, food, but that which nourishes us. Everything nourishes us. All our senses are feeding continuously on the world and all worldly objects. Therefore, all worldly objects are food. Your eyes feast upon worldly objects. Your ears are listening to sounds. This is for the ears, this is food. When you taste something, that is food. When you smell something, that is food. Because these are all food for the senses. So when this is provided to you, everything is provided to you, but you use these things, these worldly objects in a selfish manner for yourself, without offering them in return, without giving back, then you are like a thief. Take the example, all of you know what a pot, potluck is. You know, sometimes when you get invited to a potluck, it means that the host is not going to do all the cooking, but everybody brings a little contribution along to the potluck. Imagine that somebody has a potluck and everybody brings something. Only one person does not bring anything. He comes and he enjoys all the food that everybody else has contributed. What would you think about this person? You would say he is like a thief because he's eating the food but he is not making any contribution. And so it is that all the things around us, all the worldly objects are for us to enjoy. But we should not start taking ownership of these. When we enjoy these in the spirit of selflessness, without getting attached to them, we also offer things to others around us. Participate in life. That participation is a sacrifice. But if you do not participate in that life with this right attitude, then you become a thief. You only want for yourself. We want to enjoy the good things with other people. When you share the good things of life with others, we enjoy them more. It increases in intensity. And that is why the idea of sharing is very important. Share the things that you enjoy also with others. Have you ever been for a movie on your own? Have you watched a movie alone? It's no fun. You enjoy that experience much more when you have somebody to share it with. So participate in life, be inclusive, and make contributions together. This is a kind of offering with the right attitude, in very simple things. It doesn't always have to be very esoteric. Any questions to this? Any comments? So verse 13, those who eat only the remainder of the sacrifice are freed from all sins. Those sinful ones who cook only for the sake of themselves eat only sin. This elaborates on the idea of food 
that we talked about. And we make food offerings, right? And if you only cook for yourself and eat, as I mentioned, alone for yourself, basically, you're a selfish person. Do things that you sh shall share or can share with others. In the Indian tradition, it's a great deal of emphasis is laid on feeding the poor. And this is nourishing the body. And it is important because the body is our wonderful instrument that enables us to live out our desires, our samskaras in this plane. Without our body, we would not be able to complete our journey. It is important that these samskaras come up and are fulfilled. And that is only possible when you have a healthy body. So there is a certain importance given here to nourishing the body. That is one level of wisdom. But the deeper wisdom in this verse is that those who are selfish and will eat alone, they are going to suffer. The ones who are going to be freed from their sins are those who will share. Any questions on that so far? It does need a bit of um, very sensitive mind to understand this very fine wisdom here in the form of metaphors, talking about sacrifice and food. These are some of the more difficult verses in the Bhagavad Gita. And I think one of the reasons they, they're a little bit more difficult for people to understand is not only because they are these, this wisdom is wrapped in these metaphors or almost like parables, very mysterious, but also because we have not had glimpses of that in our own life. When you've had a glimpse of that joy in doing for others or sharing with others, you will be able to grasp it better. Most of the times, unfortunately, we're doing things for others or sharing with others rather reluctantly or only as a burden. And that is the challenge. How to integrate this in our daily lives. It's very easy to have theoretical discussions about, <clears throat> about this, that it's hard to integrate this in our daily lives because ahankara is always blocking us. You have to overcome that. There are many obstacles which ahankara and manas put forward and you have to go through that every time, step by step, every time, from every single day. It's not like one day all of this, you don't have to do anything anymore. You have to keep going through the process of learning to become selfless. I wanted to just check on the word sin here. I mm. thought it's somehow reserved to the Christians who have sins everywhere. But 
Is that also a translation issue here, or because it's a very strong word? Hmm. Uh, it is the bondage of karma. It is the bondage of karma which is referred to here. That to be freed from bondage of karma, you need to overcome that selfishness in you, that the egoism in you. So the word sin is perhaps not the best translation, once again. Um, once again, sin has a negative connotation, but we're talking about the bondage of karma. And we get into that bondage, as I mentioned, because we are not performing our actions skillfully. We have not learned to enjoy them. We have not learned to love our duties. We, have, we find them to be a burden. Right? And so we continue to verses 14 and 15. Again, a little bit esoteric. Beings are born from food. Food is produced through the rain god. Rain is produced through sacrifice, and sacrifice arises from action. No action to arise from the Vedas, and the Vedas to be produced from the indestructible syllable, which is Om. Therefore, all pervading knowledge of the Vedas is ever established in sacrifice. It sounds very esoteric. Food, rain god, sacrifice, and food, as you know, is everything around us. All objects of the world. Nature. Sun, rain, trees. All this is a part of the world around us. And we are all connected to each other. We are interconnected. We are not single individuals. We may seem, because we have manifested in a body, to be single, unconnected people. But because we see ourselves as unconnected or disconnected, separate people, we suffer. We experience a great deal of loneliness when we understand through these verses here that we all are a part of this beautiful cycle of nature, Prakriti. All of nature, this entire planet, the sun, the rain, the trees, all this, all the animals, all the beings, we are all connected. We experience this in the higher states of consciousness where you see this very clearly. And then we say, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the world is one family, we are one family, we are all connected to each other. And when you're part of that cycle, you experience that knowledge and you experience Om. And you learn what real karma yoga is about. As I said, it's not about picking leaves in the ashram or, or doing one day voluntary work by working in the kitchen. It's being established in the self and seeing all the world around you as one being the universal being, the cosmic being, then you say, Aham Brahmasmi, I am the universe. I and the universe are one. Any comments or insights here? I know it's a fairly esoteric uh, verse. Yeah, these are many kind of uh, 
on just reading them alone, and they seem very esoteric and complex. Yes. And looks like there's a lot of hidden meaning. Yes. Uh, behind that. Yeah. I was just wondering, rain. What, what does it signify when they say rain is produced through sacrifice? Well, you know, there's a rain cycle. And you see water, rain, is a very, very special element. We are made up of water, 70 to 80 percent. And without water, there would be no life on this planet. So rain has a very, very deep significance, deep wisdom, which is really a very strong part of us. The water cycle is really what sustains the planet. It is through the water cycle that you understand that we really are connected with each other. How these molecules evaporate and come back and go back into the ocean through the rivers. This cycle is also our cycle, the karmic cycle, the cycle of evolution. So there is a very deep connection with us and the significance of rain, which showers down on us. Does the rain ask you, should I shower on you? Have you been good today? It's unconditional. It showers on everybody and anybody. Does the sun ask, who shall I shine on? Have you been good today? Then I'll shine on you. If you're a bad person, I'm not going to shine. No. It is unconditional. So... All these are gifts. All of nature, everything that's provided is a gift. We can feast on these through the senses. It's food. We can feed on these, we can enjoy these, provided we don't get attached to them. And if we enjoy them without attachment, that's the form of sacrifice. And we also give back. We go through our phases of in nature, I think the, the verse of, after this is in fact talking about that. I can in fact go to that directly. It explains it further. He who does not revolve according to the wheel, which is thus set into motion, O son of Pritha, lives in vain his entire lifespan. Sinful, libidinous through his senses. So what does this mean? There's a certain weave of life. Nature flows in a certain way. And if we don't live in harmony with this nature, and by nature I don't mean just nature as in the beauty of and the power of mother nature, but nature also as in your own nature. If you go against your own nature, also you will suffer. So, allow these samskaras to come forth, manifest. Do these things in the right spirit. Do your action. It's the best, the quickest path. Do the action, but do it with the right, the right attitude, very skillfully. And then you perform that action instead of suppressing the action, you will allow that wheel to continue to rotate. And it doesn't go against nature. So be connected to all of nature, all of humanity, of life, and don't go against this flow. What is this flow? We talked about it earlier when I, when I said there is the path of contraction and the path of expansion. What is this path of expansion? There is a priority, prioritization of duties in the Indian traditions. We talk about the, the first duty is to yourself. This does not mean in a selfish way, duty to yourself, but in the sense of recognizing that you have a body, taking care of that body, 
and allowing yourself to manifest that which you have come to this plane to live out. Taking care of that body. That's a, the first duty. The second is your duty is to your immediate family. Third is your duties to your professional life. The professional life means to your employer, however you earn a livelihood, there is a duty you have there. The, the fourth is the duties to your extended family and friends. Fifth comes the neighborhood and the community. Participating in the neighborhood and the community around you. This is very important as well. Sixth, I think, I don't know if I'm counting right, but I think it was sixth, is your duty to your country. And seventh is the duty to all of humanity. And over and above that, the last is you can give up all these to attain the highest. So this is the path of expansion. You keep expanding. You may be very involved with yourself and your own issues, problems in life, but you learn to share your life with your family, your immediate family. You take on responsibility, you participate, you expand further in, into in your professional life, maybe training others, helping others to learn certain skills or professions. Expand further into helping, being there to support extended family and friends. Expand further to taking up community work Helping people that you don't even know anything about. A cause that you may feel strongly about. Expanding further to your nation. Expanding further to include all of humanity. And this is the path of expansion where you keep learning, growing and becoming selfless. This is naturally only possible when you become desireless, when you have already fulfilled your own desires. I would say selfish desires, but I mean, it doesn't have to be selfish in that sense of negative, but merely accepting that you are on this plane to satisfy certain desires. If you would not have any, you would not be here. So verses 17 to 19. The child of Manu who delights in the self alone and has satiety in the self, satisfied in the self alone, for him there is no action left yet to be performed. He has no purpose with the actions already performed, nor with those not yet performed. He has no dependence for any purpose on any beings at all. Therefore, perform your dutiful action incessantly, without attachment. The person who performs actions without attachment attains the Supreme. So in this verse is here, it is far more clear, it's not as esoteric as the earlier ones on sacrifice and food. A child of Manu is everybody, human beings, who is established in the self, who delights in the self alone. So what delight is very beautiful. Sporting, you know, Krishna, Sri Krishna used to dance, uh, do the to do the Ras Leela. He used to dance on the, the, along the river uh, in Vindavan. And Leela, this is a game, a sport. You delight, you enjoy it. It's not a burden, it's, it's beautiful. So one who delights in and is established in his own 
Atman. He is completely satisfied. There are more, no more desires left to be satisfied. He is already satisfied, completely um, supreme uh, desirelessness. For him, there is no action left to be performed. What shall he perform? What shall he do if he has no desires left to, for himself? So, he has no dependence on any beings at all. You are dependent on beings when you have desires to fulfill. Otherwise, you don't. So, he says, perform your actions without attachment and the one who performs actions without attachment will attain the highest. So, this path of expansion keeps leading you to the highest. The initial stages, it seems to be a bit selfish because we talked about first yourself, your own family, your, your employer, your livelihood, your friends and extended family, you know. But we are so used to thinking of these as mine, my family, my friends, my job, that we immediately think of these as also part of that my package but in reality you have already started expanding and if you use the playground that you have within the family within your professional life in the extended family and friends to enjoy that circle of love and keep expanding the circle of love to include others to become inclusive. You've expanded till all of humanity is included in this circle of love. You have then become desireless at some point of time. Because the root of bondage is desire. The samskaras, these are nothing other than desires that we have. And the root of bondage is desire. So, to go beyond this root of bondage, you fulfill your desires or you keep expanding your circle of love, performing actions without any desire for reward. Any questions on that? I hope that this, these last verses are a little bit easier to, to follow. Some of the verses here in this uh, part are, as I said, quite esoteric, but it gets better. <laughs> so. Hopefully, um, some of the verses to come will be easier to follow. Okay, it seems there are no more questions, no more contributions from anybody. I just wanted to say to those of you who are here that... Um, we will... Um, have our session on Sunday and next week also our sessions on Friday and Sunday but after that we will be taking a break I think most of you know that and uh, we will then come back in August and continue so have a nice time everybody on the weekend and we will meet up again on Sunday for Mastering Planning.